The Business Innovation Zone, also known as the Biz, is the place to start for entrepreneurs in Iowa. The Biz helps entrepreneurs and startup companies focus on idea development, business models, strategy, market validation, mentoring, and networking. We also help clients connect with qualified community and state resources needed to grow their business. Throughout the year, we provide a number of networking opportunities with experienced entrepreneurs and business leaders by offering monthly luncheons and all-day seminars on marketing and finance. You can learn more about the biz at bizci.org. Drew and I go way back. Drew was one of the first people that ever helped the biz get going when I got here. Uh, in fact, I think Susan Ramsey and pointed me towards Drew, interestingly enough. Susan's with the Greater Des Moines Partnership. Um, and was one of the first people that ever helped me with the biz. It's been a tremendous asset, does the marketing for the biz. Um, and I, for fun, was Googling him this morning. Mm. By the way, as a marketer, you, know, you, you always want to figure out, okay, how high up do they come on Google when they put their name in? It's pretty cool because he's number one, number two, number three, four, five, six, seven. He had like the first 25 slots. Much to the dismay of Drew McClellan who wrote Dreamweaver. Yes. Yeah, yeah the other Drew McClellan really doesn't like it. Um, but uh, one of the hits was his Wikipedia page, which he claims he has nothing to do with. And it states that he worked in a grocery store, first job. Second job, it said he was a security officer, but it turns out he just drove the cart. So. Yeah, moved old people from one place to another. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, Drew is nationally known as, as a a speaker on the subject of branding and the subject of social media. Uh, we really are blessed to have him here in our area. Uh, like so many people that are well known around an area, outside of their area, they're probably better known outside the area sometimes than inside the area. And I think that's the case with Drew. So I'm going to turn it over to Drew for a couple opening remarks and then we'll start taking questions. Okay, well this is uh, the free-for-all forum, so I'm going to just let you ask questions. I guarantee you uh, someone will stump me and uh, I promise I will find out the answer and get back to you. But uh, hopefully it won't be the first question right off the bat. Um, so what questions do you have? We can talk about anything. Marketing, branding, internal marketing, what's happening inside your company, how you communicate to employees, how you talk to customers, how you prospect for new business, social media. I'm game for anything. So fire, yep. Just, uh, Whoop, wait for the mic. I'm sorry. We just got a, the city of West Des Moines got a new tagline, um, position perfectly. And how, what's the best way to get that out so the people in West Des Moines know that we are positioned perfectly for the city? And okay, so the question is West Des Moines just gotten a new tagline, positioned perfectly, is that right? And the question is how do you get that word out? Well, I think you start back further and you have a piece that clearly articulates what that means, right? So, uh, and then, a, you start using it everywhere, just like you did your old tagline. You start opening meetings. Here's one of the things people forget, and uh, I always hearken this back to parenting. We believe that once we've told someone something once or twice, we are stunned that they don't remember it. And I remind you, for those of you who have children, how often you have had to repeat the same thing over and over before it sinks into their head. Well. The children are much more afraid of you than a prospect is or a customer, so they need even more information. So the rule of thumb is someone has to hear something between 8 and 13 times before they notice you're talking to them. So the, the biggest thing is just put it everywhere, repeat it often, open every city council meeting with a, as you all know, we, start, we started a new tagline, here's what it is, here's what it means. Uh, I think even getting some people uh, maybe there's a contest where West Des Moines citizens write and tell stories about what that means in their life after you articulate what it meant to the city. Because that's a tagline that a lot of people could infer a lot of different things. So it would be interesting to find out how a West Des Moines resident applies that to their own experience in the city. So you might even try some interactive things. Uh, that would be a great thing to put on your Facebook page and some things like that. Anything to get it virally out where other people are sharing it would be great. But also recognize that it's going to, I bet you money. How long did you have your old tagline? We never had a tagline. Okay. So I bet you money that if you stop the average West Des Moines resident and said, what is the city of West Des Moines tagline? A, a bunch of them will make one up that they think it is. Or B, they won't have any idea. So this is also probably a two, three, four year thing, not a two, three, four month thing. 
So give it some time, okay? All right, who else? I can always, all right, I was gonna say, I can always turn to the. In many small or startup phase businesses, sometimes the person almost comes at an equal footing with the, with the company that they're presenting. So what do you create first, the, person, the personal brand or the company brand? Yeah, you know what, that's a really interesting question. So if you guys couldn't hear him, the question is, especially in the startup, but not always in the startup, um, oftentimes the owner or the founder rises to the sort of same prominence that the company does, and in what order do you do that, and what are some of the issues with it? And I'll give you a perfect example. It's my company. So I own an agency called McClellan Marketing Group. But most people, when they see me, they go, oh, Drew McClellan. And they don't always go, and he's got a whole agency of really smart, good people behind him. Because my brand, my personal brand, sort of by accident, has eclipsed my company's brand. And we did some stupid things to make that worse. So for example, in 2006, when no one even knew what a blog was, I launched this little blog. And we already had this e-newsletter called The Marketing Minute, so we wanted to sort of keep them aligned and tell people it's sort of the same kind of content. So we decided to call the blog Drew's Marketing Minute. Well, guess what? When people think about that blog now, they don't think about McClellan Marketing Group. They think about Drew McClellan. So we wrestle with that issue all the time. So it can happen by accident, like it did with us, or it can happen by not being thoughtful. So I, I think the way to do that is to always launch the brand of the company first, and right behind it is the founder's brand. Because it is, it's much easier to hold the brand out as it gets bigger, because the ideal goal, obviously, regardless of how big a company you're building, is that your company is better known than you are in place of the company. So if most people said, oh, I need to hire a marketing agency, a lot of people, thank God, would say, oh, you should call Drew McClellan. But what they don't say is, oftentimes, they don't say you should call McClellan Marketing Group. So you want to avoid that issue that we have by holding the, building the brand first, because you always want that to be bigger than the founder, right? And letting the founder sort of push the brand, all right? Yes? Not necessarily so. I mean, so long as you're in a privately held corporation, I don't see an issue where you are the better brand uh, and uh, folks better if you would. Okay, so what he says, not necessarily so, depending on if you're privately held, maybe it's okay for an owner to, to be the brand. Let me give you a couple examples. And again, very personal examples. Apparently we're opening the kimono today. So someone calls my company and they email me and they go, Drew, Mike Caldwell said that I should sit down and have coffee with you because we need an agency and I want to hire you. That is great. I'm going to be traveling three-fourths of September and most of October, but I really want you to sit down with one of my people. Yeah, no, I want you, Drew, right? So that's one of the problems. The other problem is I'm 50 years old. I don't want to do this forever, so I've built this asset, right? I want to sell it. Do you think I can get more money for it if it stands alone or if it's tied to me? Because if I sell it, I probably don't want to stay, right? That's the whole point of selling it. So I think in the short run, you're right. And it's easier to build a personal brand than it is a company brand. But in the long term, when you think about the growth of your company, in most cases, I think it is better to build the brand of the company and let the CEO, founder, rainmaker, whatever that position is, take a secondary role. Sure. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. When you're starting a new business, how important is a tagline? When you are starting a new business, how important is a tagline? Um, like all marketing questions, the answer to that is it depends. So here's some of the things it depends on. If the name of your business, Bob's Concrete Layers, tells me exactly what you do, tagline a little less important, right? Because a tagline and a brand should tell me how or why. Here's a, brands shouldn't tell me what you do. Brands should tell me how or why you do it and why you're different from everybody else who does what you do. But if I can at least see your name and I get what you are, then a tagline in the beginning is less important because in the beginning you're just trying to find three customers so you can pay your mortgage so you can build to the next level. But if your name is something like uh, Xerox, 
right? I have, we now all know what that means, but when they started it, we had no idea because it, it was a pretend word. So if your name is, a, and a lot of web companies today, we make up a lot of words. So if your name doesn't tell me exactly what you do, then your tagline by default has to be descriptive about what it is you offer. And then in the startup phase, it's vital because otherwise I have no idea if I can or should or would ever hire you because I don't know what you do. Ultimately, a brand becomes a huge difference in a small business. It's, I think it's a bigger deal in a small business, and frankly, I think it's a bigger deal in a, B, a B2B business than it is in a big business or a B2C business because it's really the only way you differentiate yourself. It's the only way you sort of get the message out of there's 12 people who, there's 12 marketing agencies in Des Moines. Here's what we do that's a little different. Here's how we do it a little different. So eventually it becomes very important. In the beginning, it depends, okay? And let me take one from the pile here. Oh, I shouldn't have taken this one. Okay, uh, what is the next big thing in social media? And then they listed 3,000 things. Uh, Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook, Foursquare, LinkedIn, there are so many avenues, what's next? I have no idea. And that's the reality. Anybody who tells you they know is lying. Because there are some trends that we know that are coming. So for example, one of the trends that is tied right to social media is mobile. Do you know that in 2013, more of us will access the internet by our phones than we do by computers sitting on our desk or in our backpack? So that's, that's a game changer for all of us. And if you're not paying attention to mobile, and if you don't have a website that looks great on a smartphone, you better get to it in a hurry, okay? But in terms of social media specifically, Pinterest is very hot right now, but businesses are struggling to figure out, other than the SEO juice that it gives them, how to actually capture it and use it for business. Facebook is, of course, the giant in the room, but they continue to struggle and you know, with the IPO debacle and everything else, people are starting to say, well, maybe Facebook won't be around that long. And one of the reasons why is because they haven't figured out how to mobile, tie their mobile advertising well into their platform. And most of us today are accessing Facebook on our smartphones. So the revenue that they drive off of the desktop page is gonna be challenged by the fact that we don't go by desktop anymore. Google Plus is sort of the dark horse because everyone goes, well, no one is there. But you know who is there? Google is there. And one of the reasons why any of us are active in social media is because of the search engine optimization value. And who do you suppose is gonna get preferential treatment from Google in terms of SEO placement? Facebook, which they're not allowed to index, or Google Plus, which they happen to own, right? So if you start watching, you're gonna start seeing a lot more Google Plus entries into that first page or two of Google. So if SEO is very important to you, you really can't ignore Google Plus, even though you think no one is paying attention to you. Because if, even if no one else is, Google is. Uh, you know, Twitter continues to struggle. It's, it's a very niche product. Uh, it's fascinating to me how three years ago, Nobody was talking about it, and now you cannot turn on a television show. You can't see anything without uh, the, you know, the Twitter icon, the Facebook icon. It's really become just mainstream for us. So the question is, I think, twofold. One, at what point will we say too much, too much, too much, and what will we eliminate from the mix? Because right now, according to this person, and they're absolutely right, there's so many choices. We are going to start self-selecting down. Right? And so the question is not what's new. I think the real question is, what are we going to decide is not valuable enough to invest our time in? And I think, that, I think that for businesses, Pinterest may be one of the ones that's on the block, although right now it's the darling. So we'll see how that plays. A question from the audience? Or I, yep, Christian. Well, just to, to follow up on that, <clears throat> as, as a business, we feel compelled to be on all these social networks. But as a consumer of that, it's now become the fire hose, and I think we yep. all experience that. What tips do you have for a business to make sure that the interactions they have 
are valuable and help stand out from that stream of nonsense. Okay, so the question is, as businesses, we look at all these channels and think, I have to be there, I have to be there, I have to be there, I have to be there. But when we put on our consumer hat, it's like drinking from a fire hose and it's too much. And a lot of what businesses put out into the social media networks is not relevant to us. We don't care. We tune it out. So the question is, how do you make sure your content is valuable? And this will sound ridiculously simple, but pay attention and see how often it is ignored. If you write and you share content that is in the best interest of your audience, it's stuff they care about, not stuff you care about. It's not about your sale. It's not about anything that you sell. It's tangentially related to what you sell, but it is of value to them. That's what they care about. You know, the, the harsh reality is they don't care about us and our company and our product and our service. They care about their life and their world. And so what you have to figure out is how do you share content that connects to that? So, uh, you know, one of the great things that you see happening all the time in social media is when you stop talking at them and you ask a question and you actually are listening when they answer and then respond back, all of a sudden that becomes this great dialogue that you have to remember a couple thousand people or better are eavesdropping on. So it really is no different than, you know, we, we've talked about this I think here before, but it's sort of like going to a party and walking up to somebody and introducing yourself and saying, you know, hey Stan, I'm Drew McClellan. I want to spend the next 30 minutes telling you all about me, right? And Stan is going, oh my God, I have to make an excuse. I have to get away. I have to run. But if I walk up to Stan and I say, Stan, nice to meet you. I'm Drew McClellan. Tell me, what do you do? And we talk a little bit about that. And oh, really? Okay. And I start asking questions. Stan leaves thinking that I am a fascinating conversationalist. Why? Because we talked about Stan, right? So if you can mimic that behavior, and the rule that we follow with clients and ourselves are that we will talk about ourselves about once every 10th time. So nine or 10 times we want to offer something of value that is not related to buy something from me or here's what we do for a living, right? And then the 10th time we might do that in a subtle way and then we go right back to adding value. But that sounds ridiculously simple but you pay attention to your own Twitter stream or Facebook or even LinkedIn and you watch how often that self-promotional stuff and we will see why it feels like a fire hose that we want to turn off. Next question. I'm asking. Drew, hi. Um, I've got a startup company. It's in the bed and breakfast industry. Um, in order to get a name for myself, I had to actually, because of SEO, reasons I had to get something bed and breakfast in it. But I find myself mired in literally hundreds and hundreds of other companies in this particular industry. How do I branch off? How do I break from the pack as so to speak, branding myself as something of uh, so that you know I can just move away from the bed and breakfast and then build a brand on the in this industry. Okay, so the question is have a startup, it's in the B and B industry. For SEO reasons I had to get a URL and a name that had bed and breakfast in it, but now I'm sort of stuck in this big pool. I, I have absolutely no idea without asking you a few more questions. So give me an idea, tell me a little more about the business. Okay, it's a, it's a, I'm an aggregator of bed and breakfast owners throughout the world. I do global marketing for them. Okay, so you do marketing for B&B &B owners. Correct. So your audience is not people who want to go to a B&B, &B, but it's the B&B &B operators. Operators. Okay, sure. okay. Sure. And you're offering them... Um, Okay. Okay. So one of the things that often happens with all marketing, but certainly with stuff that happens online, is pretty much the entire world is your audience. And frankly, for most of us, we have no desire to talk to the entire world. And in fact, the entire world has no desire to talk to us, right? So it's really about slicing the apple as thin as you can. So how do you get to... So what you need to worry about is where do B&B &B operators hang out? Where do they talk? Not just online, but in physical space. Sometimes I think we forget that we can market offline, right? I mean, we could actually go to a trade show, for example. We can actually buy a print ad. You know, that is not a dead industry, depending on what you're doing. So I think the trick is probably in the online world, 
you're going to live a little bit in that space for a while. One of the ways to break loose is to create content that is specifically aimed at B&B operators. So if I land on your website as a, as a potential B&B stayer, res, you know, I am going to go, up, oh, not for me. And the more content you can create that is aimed at the operator, the more the search engines will sort you out. But part of that is also, probably in the beginning, getting offline and going and hanging out where they hang out. So, you know, if you were going to go on a photo safari and you wanted to shoot a photograph of a rhino, you would go hang out where rhinos hang out, so you would have the likelihood of finding them. And in marketing, it's the same thing. You sort of have to figure out where their watering hole is, and you need to actually get off your butt and go there and hang out with them and have conversations with them and then invite them back to where you live online and make that connection. But oftentimes, online connections need to start offline. So uh, the big thing for you in terms of SEO and online, though, is content that, you know, using phrases like, uh, as a bed and breakfast operator, uh, when you welcome the guest to your bed and breakfast, you know, thinking about phrases that only an operator would use or would find valuable, because odds are if they're searching for you, they are looking for something a little more specific. Most of us don't go to Google and just put one word in anymore. We, most often, we put in some sort of a phrase. We phrase our search in the form of either a question or a statement. So you need to put that kind of content on. So you know, go, go to one of the tools at Google that shows you what phrases are searched most often and create content around those, phase, those phrases to draw more people to you that are actually your potential customer.